Good morning. Good morning. We are about to begin. We're going to have the tributes as they appear on the order. Firstly, Michelle Rose, La Cynthia Dixon, then Matthew Grant, Edward Harvey, and then the recital from Mrs. Carol Dixon, and then the eulogy remembrance from Mr. Raymond Grant. Now we are going to proceed as set out here on the order of service. There will be no announcements in between these suits. The persons will come as their names appear on the program and do their piece. This also obtains for the rest of the service because there are readings. Persons who are to read will come as their names appear on the service order. Only we can announce this during the service because the service will proceed unannounced as set out on the order. So we begin now with the tributes. Michelle Rose, the Cynthia Dixon, Matthew Grant, Edward Harvey, Carl Dixon, and Raymond Grant, beginning now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Okay. So, ask you to bear with me on both. Okay. 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 So, I'm going to ask you to bear with me on uh, probably what is one of the most difficult days of my life. Uh, first, I'd like to say good morning to all of you, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us to not only mourn the passing, but also the life of Mrs. Valerie LaCynthia Sybil Grant. So, uh, some of you may already know me. Uh, maybe some of you here just know me either by face or name. Um, if you ever heard my grandmother um, talk about her first grandchild, that's me. All right, I'm her first. So my name, my full name, is Michelle Rose LaCynthia Dixon. And I love my names. And I've always loved my names. I have tried to put them on all my official documentation. It's on my driver's license, which kind of makes it confusing for people <laughs> when I present it to them, because all the first three names are together, so I have to tell them which is my first name. And it's on my college degree. And that was a fight, because me and the university went back and forth, because for whatever reason, they thought there should be a P in La Cynthia. Oh, goodness. So, that's me. Um, I would love to stay up here and tell you about all the fond memories I have of my grandmother, but we don't have that kind of time today. Uh, uh, I can tell you that my grandmother was on a 20-odd year campaign 
asking me three questions. When are you going to cut off your locks? When are you going to get married? And when are you going to have children? So that was our thing, back and forth for, yeah, since my early 20s. Um, after a while, she stopped with the, with the locks. You know, I like to think that was my grandmother getting with the times. But she never stopped with the other two, right? Over and over and over. So that was sort of our thing, right? So with her gone, you know, it's going to be weird not to hear that from her anymore. I mean, I have the rest of my family to hear it from, you know. <laughs> but it's just not going to be the same. Uh, another memory I have is silver bracelets. So for as long as I can remember, I always wore a pair of silver bracelets on my right hand for my grandmother. When I was about 10 or 11, she got me another pair with openings because I guess you get older, right? They were closed, so they started to get too small for my hand. So I never took them off, not ever. And that's how I lost one, 10 years later, when I was at the beach. And I was so devastated. And when I told my grandmother, she went and got me another one because she knew how important it was to always wear a pair. And I still wear them today, and I'll never take them off. <sighs> so, I will say that I was never gonna be ready to live in a world without my grandmother. But I am so thrilled and honored to have had her in my life for as long as I did. And I know that I can move on in life because of the three things she left me. She left me my precious silver bracelets. She left me 43 years of memories and she left me her name. So I'd like to thank you all. Okay. Go this way. Good morning. My cousin Matthew couldn't be here this morning, so I will read his tribute on his behalf. Can you hear me? I'm sorry? Is that better? Is that better? Okay. Good morning. My cousin Matthew couldn't be here this morning, so I'm going to read his tribute on his behalf. My name is Jamie Dixon. In moments of quiet reflection, the enormity of the loss we've experienced becomes overwhelmingly clear with the passing of my dear grandmother. My family and myself would like to express our deep gratitude of your love and support during this difficult period. On a personal level, the vastness of the Atlantic Ocean has never felt greater as I'm unable to be with my loved ones in body. However, I am there in spirit. One of my fondest memories of my grandmother was my first trip to Disneyland. I remember arriving at Disneyland with grandmother and the rest of the family. I was overwhelmed with an impending sense of doom stemming from the fact that I was petrified of roller coasters. However, I was soon relieved to find that I was too short to get on the ride. As I exhaled a sigh of relief, I was shocked to see grandmother locked in what looked like a stern negotiation with one of the employees. 
She then turned with good news, explaining that she had convinced them to let me on the ride. Upon hearing this, I erupted into a flood of tears. Grandmother then gave me a comforting look, handed me her bag and said, I'll see you at lunch, dear. She went on to go on all the roller coasters, leaving me with dad to find other options to entertain ourselves. Her adventurous and at times childlike nature was a feature that I loved and which endeared her to so many. Despite this thrill-seeking side, she always seemed happiest at our family occasions surrounded by her loved ones. Of all the descriptions that can be used to describe her larger-than-life character, the one I believe encapsulates her is resilience. The strength and grace in which she stood up to the hardships of life is something that few are gifted with, epitomized by her calming, excuse me, reassuring and loving demeanor in which she guided and cared for us all, individually and collectively. Her presence will be greatly missed. Good morning, everyone. Um, today is supposed to be a very sad day in that um, we have lost, we have lost, good, yeah. we have lost a loved one, Aunt Valerie. Aunt Valerie is known as Precious, but we, the smaller one, had to call her Aunt Valerie. We could never dare call her Precious. Now, the beauty about it is that Aunt Valerie had seven children. My mother had nine. It is quite coincidental in that only last night I found out that it all began where we were paired up, or they were paired up from, I think it was Cornell, coming down to the last where is the race then, so to speak, right? They had um, nine children, sorry, seven children. And the beauty about it is that we look forward, all look forward for Christmas Day, whether we are going to get there early to beat the grands or the grands get there early to beat us because it was that time everybody gathered, everybody. No matter where you are, Timbuktu, you had to be at Christmas breakfast, right? Aunt Valerie, to me, was not only Aunt Valerie, she was my godmother. And that makes it a difference of all of us. I was very, very close to Aunt Valerie. And she had this infectious laughter that you couldn't miss. She was very kind, generous in the respect that um, she played the piano and she took my daughters to piano lessons occasionally when she could or when they could rather because she was always there willing and able, right? Um, with regards to what she has achieved that, you know, many people her age it was almost unheard of, that is driving. She drove occasionally to the home where I used to live, and um, I would wonder how she managed, because everybody her age was scared to drive at that time. She made the bold step, and she did. Secondly, she taught piano lessons, and she was very good at it. I can actually hear her sometimes singing 
This robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to see the everlasting Christ. That always stick with me for a long, long time and always will. Now, she has lived through a generation and a new generation that is too, where technology came into effect. And she made sure she was in it. So she had her cell phone. You could call her on her cell phone and you'd normally get her, right? I would say that Aunt Valerie came into this world as a blessing. Therefore, what she has left behind is a legacy. I don't know how many people here would be participating or had participated in her teaching pianist lesson, but she has left a legacy for us all to follow. I thank you. Good morning. Although not stated on the program, my dear sister, Sandra, the third child of Vary Grant, my mother, is not well. And as such, she's the only one who is absent this morning from our group. So she's watching it, hopefully, by live stream. But she wanted to say these words. My sister is a poet, and she has always written wonderful poetry. And this particular one was called Tribute to Mother. So in honor of my sister not being here, I'm reading her tribute. Oh, Mom, I wish I told you long ago how much you mean to me. But I didn't really understand until I became a mom, you see. Now I know how much you did and what you gave up for me. Your freedom, your time, your comfort, and all your childhood dreams. For I became the main reason you struggled on each day, no matter how you felt or what may come your way. Through hard work or play, whatever the day, your goal and focus never swayed my comfort my well-being, my daily bread, and somewhere always to lay my head. A good father you chose for me to help me with my care, although I know you would carry on even if he wasn't there. Now I'm grown. I want to give you all the honor and thanks you deserve, for you have given me your time, your youth, your care, and your love. I love you, Mom.
This is a musical recording of a piano piece by my mother's first daughter, Carol. Two of us play the piano in the family. And it's called River Flows in You by Yoruba. <laughs> I think the mic is a little low. Sorry, the mic is a little low. I can't, can't get to play it. Can you play it? Jesus Christ. Eh? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, 
Are you hearing me well? Yes. Valerie Lacintia Sibyl Hamilton was born on March 20, 1930, to Rose Edwards, um, affectionate lotus as Aunt Derant, and Nathan Hamilton, affectionate noted us as Papa Nathan. She was the third and last child for the mother Rose. Mom's two older brothers, Basil and Lionel, as expected, was very protective of their younger sister, as well as her mother. Mom grew up on Duke Street and spent some time in Mandeville as a result of her mother, Rose, marrying Sigmund Bramwell, who had roots in Mandeville, um, let's say Manchester. Mom was a, straight, was a trained stenographer and entered the armed services in her late 20s at the time of World War II. From an early age, her mother taught her to play the piano and that continued to be a central part of our life. Passing on that skill to two daughters, Carol and Patricia. Mom was a music teacher for over 55 years. We grew up listening to the delightful piano music nearly every day of the week. We are forced to love and appreciate music. Ladies and gentlemen, as we celebrate our mother's life and final farewell, we'd like to briefly highlight some of the interesting and formative events of each stage of our life journey. I'm speaking on behalf of our seven children, 13 grandchildren, eight great-grandchildren, and other dear relatives and friends. At 93, she indeed had a, both a long and eventful life. Growing up, during her childhood, mom had to cope with the mischievous antics of her two brothers, Lenny and Basil. In fact, I'm named after Basil. That's my middle name. One of the, one of the brothers often gave her pocket money. I won't say which one it is. And the other graciously helped her to spend it, mostly on cigarettes. <laughs> Mom was driven and a high achiever, as seen by her excellence in playing the piano. Her mother, dear aunt, would often ask her to perform for guests. However, one day, the rebellious spirit we would all grow to love took over her, and she refused to play. As expected, if you know dear aunt, my grandmother well, such actions had consequences. The music tutoring abruptly stopped, and mom's music career was put on hold. Courting. As expected, for those of you who look at the center page, um, mom, with such beauty and charm, had many would-be suitors who had great difficulty in just getting to base one. That is just speaking to mom. On the dear aunt's watchful eyes, Many would be suitors were mercilessly chased away, and if they tried to be persistent, a broom was used to dissuade them, proving to be very, very effective. The question is, how did my dad succeed? The perfect strategy, rented a room from their aunt. So this was an inside job. The rest is history. Whenever a would-be suitor appeared at mom's gate, mom would hear a voice. Who is that scapegoat at the gate? Tell him to go away. <laughs> Marriage before children, kids. As mom and dad embraced on their first phase of their life together, they ingeniously decided to spend the first five years without the burden of their dear children. Don't know why they don't want to do that. <laughs> A lesson for the next generation of grants to consider. This renaissance period 
like others in history, were filled with skills acquisition in which both mom and dad took to education. Mom resumed and completed her piano tutoring lessons while dad qualified as a chartered accountant. With, a, with the prospects of family on the horizon, mom settled reluctantly into domestic life, setting the stage for decades of chaos to follow with the arrival of kids. Kids start arriving. After a five-year wait and their first experience with childbirth, our dear parents stumbled upon their first child, Cornell, and they kept arriving. In fact, there seemed to have been a competition between my mom and our brother, Uncle Lenny. Every 12 to 18 months welcomed the arrival of a new child. <laughs> this continued for five more years, resulting in six kids being born in the same year from mom and Uncle Lenny. So each of us here have a, have a corresponding cousin who is Harvey, that's here. <laughs> But that seemed to have been the end of the rivalry. But then, lo and behold, three years later, mom came out of retirement with my last brother, Arnold, <laughs> who, to, who to this day is still referred to as the baby. <laughs> mom briefly contemplated returning to the workforce, but was dissuaded by dad who felt that it would not be in the best interest of the children to go back to work as a testament of our commitment as a mother. In the spirit of mom's ability to think outside of the box, she decided to bring work home, launching a long-standing career teaching music from home. At one point, there was over 100 students um, that she taught. Over the years, many testament to mom's diligence and patience when teaching. <clears throat> However, to mom letting people into her home was not just out of convenience. It was a metaphor for how she shared more than a teacher and took on a maternal and caring role, not just to her children, but to students, her friends, the Church of Transfiguration, and all that came into contact with her. Homemaker. One of the privileges that we all benefited from growing up with mom and dad was that they were not just incredible individuals, but also an unstoppable team. Both parents were secure in their complementary roles and possessed complementary personalities instilling in all of us the importance of education, humility, acceptance of others, and differences, as well as the importance of family. Dad's death, as you know, that would have been a traumatic occasion in this family. As we gather here today to remember my celebrating mom's life, it is impossible not to reflect on the profound loss she end endured when her father passed away 25 years ago, his untimely passing in a tragic car accident left a void that seems unsurmountable. Yet in the face of such adversity, she formed a reservoir of strength within herself that even she might not have known existed. With remarkable resilience, she turned her sorrow into a quest for life embracing on journeys to different countries, embracing diverse cultures, and finding joy in the smallest moments. Her, travel, her travels became a testament to her youthful exuberance and tenacity for life. Her life so deeply troubled by loss became an inspiration, inspiring narrative of courage and enduring reminder that even in the darkest times, there is light, hope, 
and the possibility of new beginning. Later life. One of the silver lining that comes with significant loss is that this unshakable dream team that was our parents is reunited at last in the kingdom of heaven. Later life comes with the challenges as one body is not what it once was and mom was no exception to this. As accounts in our tributes had shown, she never lost her tenacity for her life. Among this challenging time, one of our grandchildren, Kerry, played an important role, acting as support and a voice of loving company, which mom greatly appreciated. Mom and the entire family are grateful for the effort and dedication to her during this period. Mom bore these obstacles, and despite needing to be looked after, she never lost her desire to look after us. Intelligence. Despite the physical challenges mom faced later in life, one aspect of her which remained constant was her outstanding mind. Mom served for these many, for those many years her junior. And acting both as a legitimate voice of reasoning as well as a window into the psyche of previous times. She was all intents and purposes, a voice of reasoning, a respiratory of wisdom, a library of wit and jokes, and a bridge between generations. Her profound understanding of foresight not only enriched her life, but also illuminated the lives of those around us. My son Matthew, who had a special relationship with his grandmother, looks to her as a source of inspiration as he aims to obtain a PhD. To us, all she was leaving, to us all, she was leaving a legacy of enlightenment and inspiration. Now I come to this section, fun, loving section. This is not even scripted. What I say here today does not leave Transfiguration Church. <laughs> I'm going to tell you three antidotes that describe um, mom adventurousness. There's a certain cousin, I won't call any name, she's in the audience, she knows herself, and wiggled mom to accompany them as a group to a strip club. <laughs> a stripper came by and they thought that mom would have been embarrassed. But lo and behold, to their surprise, she started to inspect his abs and other finer features. That was mom for you. On one of our journeys abroad, um, to look for my sister, um, Carol, my sister she was going to look for, noticed that mom was taking a long time. She, they couldn't find her. Eventually, when they found her, um, mom related that she met this nice man who wanted to take her out to dinner. So, of course, to a meal, of course, she obliged him. <laughs> Uh, the final one, and remember, this does not leave the church. Uh, other brother, Ricky, and a friend of mom from school days went out to have dinner, and waiter came by with the drink order, and mom said, I'll have a, a peanut. Yeah. So the waiter looks at her and said, um, virgin or regular? Mom's reply, do I look like a virgin? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Goodbye. As this testament draws to a close, it will be wrong to forget how fortunate we have been to have our mom with us for all of 93 years. Our last gathering of the family was in August 2022 when Carol hosted us all in Atlanta. In addition to being back together again following the pandemic, the highlights of this trip was mom's final piano recital. This memory will never be forgotten for myself, siblings, 
and other family members who were privileged to be there. Goodbye for now, Mom. We miss you, but we are glad that your suffering is old age is over, and we hope we manage to show how much we appreciated all that you and your dad gave us. That despite our many complaints, we loved you as much as you loved us. Thank you. Jesus Christ, we see the body of our sister back by the burial. Our sister by the washed in holy baptism and now to the Holy Spirit. This day with confidence, pray to God our Heavenly Father, to give out life, to be raised in perfection, in the comfort of the saints. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and glory, go for you this day, our sister Valerie. We stand to forgive her to us, her family and friends, to know and love as they come upon an earth of pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who we will stay to see the gate of eternal life. So with quiet confidence, may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited to those who have gone before, through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord.
mighty God, we for you today, your servant family. And we pray that God will open to the gates of the land of your life. You receive her one more to enjoy the service. That all of serving the past, she may share the eternal victory of Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The reading is from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 3. The year of the Lord's favor. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captains and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. This is the word of the Lord.
press two to seven. Okay. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and, their, and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write these words down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children.
15, yeah, 51, yeah. says that. Good morning. Third reading from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 58. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with the mortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the mortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting. The sting of death is sin, but the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My association with the departed is primarily through her daughters and sons. And um, it's an honor for me to bring this message this morning. Let us pray. Lord, we bow in your presence. Thank you that you are indeed the God of mercy and grace and reminding us that physical death is not the end of our existence. For those who know Jesus Christ as Savior, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Speak your truths into our minds and hearts, emotions and will, and cause them to bring real comfort and light up our lives with hope at this Thanksgiving service. We bless you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we contemplate the home going of Valerie Grant, Dear mother of three daughters and of four sons, the words of the Apostle James, as recorded in James chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, the words go to now, he that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such in such a place and buy and sell and get gain whereas they know not what shall be on the morrow for what is your life it is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanishes away establish the fact that the issues of death and eternity 
are issues that we are all inextricably bound up with. Every day we live, we are moving closer and closer to them. That we cannot, because we cannot wish them into oblivion, because we cannot stop them from overtaking us, wisdom dictates that we face up to them and make adequate preparations for them. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul was doing when he declared in Philippians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In fact, when the Apostle Paul was bombarded by the disappointments, frustrations, and seemingly insurmountable challenges of life, he was able, in the first place, to find an anchor for his soul and a bright hope for his tomorrows by looking beyond them to his glorious future in Jesus Christ. For his confident declaration in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through verse 18 was, for this cause, we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, where we look not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, only for a time. But the things that are not seen are eternal. So as we contemplate the homegoing of Valerie Grant, a beloved mother and friend, we're reminded of the fact that when Paul went on to declare in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle was destroyed, we have a building of God. Do you know that? We have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. He was acknowledging the fact that as tents are temporary structures, so are our bodies. Could I say that again? A reminder. As tents are temporary structures, so are our bodies. For like tents, our bodies have a way of deteriorating with the passing of time. If you don't die from disease, you'll die from old age. Amen? And in the face of the changing weather, health storms, tents have to be taken down and replaced by more permanent structures. When we study God's word, it becomes clear that our body is like a tent. One of these days is going to be taken down. But that is not the end. It will be replaced by a permanent structure that will spend its eternity either in heaven or in hell. 
You hear me? No, those are not very things to hug up and shout about, but they are realities. Death is not the end. If you study God's word, it becomes clear that when we die, the life that can't end begins, and that life will spend its eternity either in heaven or in hell. So as we contemplate the home going of Valerie Grant, we're reminded, secondly, that we live in a world where everything is temporary. Could I say that again? We live in a world where everything is temporary. When the Apostle Paul declared in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, for the things that are seen are temporal. For the things that you can see with your eyes are temporal. But the things that are not seen with the natural eye are eternal. He was reminding us of the fact that everything around us, including our body, is decaying, dying, passing away. That the only thing about us that is eternal is our soul. Part that can think and feel. This body is just a house, you know. The real you live in there. And that part can never die. Can never die. It's your soul. And by the way, we are all going. We are all going. Whether we are high or low. <laughs> whether we are rich or poor. Whether we are educated or uneducated. We are all going and will soon be gone. For some people it comes suddenly. No warning. For others we get sick. Have a lot of time to think about it. But it comes to all of us. Some people go to bed. Planning for tomorrow and never wake up. Death comes to all of us. And we have to face up to these truths. And as humbling. As humbling. And as painful. As these truths are. It is critical that we face up to them and make adequate preparations for them. For it is an inescapable fact that the houses we live in, the riches we accumulate, the relationships we enter into are only temporary. Temporary. Don't kid yourself. And by the way, you can't take them with you. When you die, you leave them where? All behind. All behind. As James, Pastor James puts it, life is as a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanishes away. And while the words of 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 are to be a warning to the unredeemed, they ought to be at the same time a source of comfort to every born-again child of God. Going through a rough time now, we go through them. Pain, sickness, sorrows, come upon us but they're only for a time one day we will be completely delivered where there'll be no more pain no more sorrow no more sickness our trials our crosses our losses our pains our sorrows 
are only temporary. And the person who should rejoice in that is not the unsaved person who doesn't care about his soul or God, but the person who knows Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. You can rejoice in the fact that it can't last. Either that Christ will take you home or he will return and take you home to heaven bodily. When Paul declared in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle was destroyed, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. He was making it crystal clear that death for the born-again child of God is only the dismantling of his earthly tent to allow him to take up permanent residence in his indestructible heavenly host. That's all it is for the child of God. For the clear teaching of scripture is that death for the born again child of God is not a termination. Don't kid yourself. Don't let anybody fool you. Death, physical death is not the end. It's not a dead end street it is a glorious highway for the child of God to heaven in fact when Paul went on to declare in 1st Corinthians 15 verse 10 but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept for as in Adam all died that's how we're born. We're born in Adam. We're born of the sons of Adam. And we died in him. But in Christ. So when you recognize your sinfulness, recognize that what God has done for you in Jesus Christ and embrace him as your savior, you are placed in Christ as it were. And he said, in Christ shall all be made alive. It's critical that we analyze our lives and settle the issue as to where we are. Are we still only in Adam? Or has there been a time when we came in Christ? The fact that he who made death a successful exodus a successful transition from mortality to immortality <coughs> will ensure that the death of those he has redeemed with his own precious blood will be no less successful. And Jesus was echoing this precious truth and he declared in Revelation 1 17 B and 18. He said, Fear not, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, dead. And look, behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. And when I open, no man shut. And when I shut, no man open. Terrible times we are going through. Frightening times. Dangerous times. We could be wiped out at any moment. But if you know Jesus Christ as Savior, remember he has the keys. And death cannot hold you pray forever. One day he will turn the key and set you free and take you home to glory. Take those home to glory who have embraced him as Savior and Lord. And by the way, it's not just being religious. You hear me? He's having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. <coughs> being religious alone can't get you to heaven. Then when Paul went on to declare in 2 Corinthians 4, 18 and the B part, for the things that are seen are temporal. Whatever you can look on, 
God lasts forever. That lovely home you built, sacrificed and built, can't last. They're only temporary. The only thing that is everlasting, my friend, is your soul and the salvation that you have in Jesus Christ. So he was in thirdly and finally, the fact that when we die, you don't have to wait until you get sick to expect death. It comes in different ways. Many people die who are never sick. Just die. In an accident, just die. We are going to a place where everything is eternal. When the last trumpet has sounded and the dead are raised, the state in which you find yourself will be endless, everlasting, eternal. There'll be no change. There'll be no decay. There'll be no goodbye. There'll be no morning, no evening. For the Bible says, for the former things have passed away. And Peter, celebrating this unchangeable truth, precious, unchangeable truth, declares in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, when he says, in celebration, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. And that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us who are kept by the power of God, which is revealed in the last days. And Paul, in contrast, highlighting the terrifying destiny of the unredeemed, tells us in 2 Thessalonians 1 9, those who know not God shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. We have enough warning, you know. We have enough truth. And the word of God says, you shall know the truth. If you embrace the truth, the truth shall what? Set you free. As Paul Tillich, Paul Tillich, the German theologian, puts it. He says, time is our destiny. Time is our despair. Time is the mirror in which we see eternity. And Paul Tillich was right. For it is the way that we spend our time that will reflect in advance what our eternal future will be like. It's an awful delusion for any man to think he can live wickedly, die wickedly, and rise again righteously. In whatever spiritual state we live and die, that is the spiritual state in which we will rise again. And that is the spiritual state in which we live throughout all eternity. By the way, let me say it again. Death, physical death doesn't end it. Just take it to another realm where we can't die again, whether it is in hell or in heaven. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, your state in eternity is directly dependent on your state in time. You can't live wickedly, die wickedly, and rise again righteously. In whatever spiritual state you live and die, that is the spiritual state in which you will rise again. And that is a condition or state in which you will be through the endless ages of eternity. As the Apostle Paul puts it, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
He who sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he who sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So I say to you as I close, if you don't know Jesus, you can't look at a point in time when you recognize you need Jesus in your life. You need to be saved. You need to be forgiven. And you embraced him as your personal savior. You acknowledge that his death on the cross paid in full for your sins. And you embraced him that been living your life for him. So that when you face the enemy called death, You'll be able to confidently declare like the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, 20 and 21. Call it to my earnest expectation and my hope. That in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And when Paul was bombarded by the disappointments, frustrations, and seemingly insurmountable challenges of life. He was able to find an anchor for his soul and a bright hope for his tomorrow by looking beyond them to his glorious future in Jesus Christ. For his confident declaration, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, I leave this with you. For this cause, we faint not. Though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, where we look not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, and the things that are not seen are eternal. What I've said to you this morning is that something I have made up. I've taken God's word and expounded it to you. And the word of God says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word shall never pass away. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And the word of God says, the entrance of God's word in your mind, in your heart, in your emotion, in your will. Not only gives light, but gives life. I beg you, for your own sake, if you have never done that. And it's good to go to church, thank God for the church, and thank God for those who have given themselves over to teach God's word. But simply going to church and being a member for church can't get you to heaven. You have to be born again. Accept a man be born again, I'm quoting, you cannot see, much less to enter the kingdom of God. Think about it. And act consistently with those truths. Let's bow our heads, and our hearts, in prayer. You said in your word, Father, we shall know the truth. And the truth shall set us free. The truth is not what we not originate with us. The truth comes only from you, the living and true God. <coughs> and we ask if there's any in the audience today who cannot look back at a point in time when he or she embraced your Savior. Might be active in church, maybe even singing in the choir. But if we can't look at a point in time when he or she acknowledge his or her sin sinfulness and embrace your Savior, <coughs> that person is on his way to hell. Help us to humble ourselves, submit to God, and let him do his life-transforming work in our lives. Bless this audience and help us to reflect on the fact and Make certain that we are ready for death and we are ready for the coming of Christ. And the word of God says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as Lord, 
and believe in that heart that the Christ who died, God raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Let God be true and every man a liar. The Lord bless you. And if you have questions and you want to have some of these answers, I'm the minister for Haven Hill Baptist. You can contact our office and we will help you to clarify these things. Lord bless you. Thank you. Let us pray with confidence to God our Father, who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead for the salvation of all. Grant, Lord, that your servant may know the fullness of life which you have promised to those who love you. Lord, in your mercy, be close to those who mourn. Increase their faith in your undying love. Lord, in your mercy, May we be strengthened in our faith, live the rest of our lives in fellowship with your Son, and be ready when you call us to the fullness of life. Lord, in your mercy, yes, Lord. show your mercy to the dying, strengthen them with hope, and fill them with the peace and joy of your presence. Lord, in your mercy. We commend all people to your unfailing love, that in them your way may be fulfilled, and we rejoice at the faith, faithful witness of your saints in every age, praying that we share with them in your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our sister Valerie, who was reborn by word in the spirit of holy baptism. And after her death, we are called us her, your victory for death, and the occasion for us to renew our trust in her father's life. He must be prayed to follow. He must be prayed the faith to follow where you have led the way. For you live and reign the Father and the Holy Spirit for the ages of ages. Amen. Amen.
Just an announcement, please. Um, cars license number 2254GK. Looks like a Suzuki. Um, another one, um, car number 560562HK. And a Honda 1755HV. People need to move, so could you ask, could you remove your car so that they can leave? It's an emergency. Thank you. Last night I lay sleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in all Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, methought of a voice of angels from heaven it answer
And then methought my dream was changed, the streets no longer rang. Hushed with the glad hosannas, the little children sang. The sun grew dark with mystery, the morn was cold and chill. And the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill. As the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And once again the scene was changed to earth there seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside the tireless sea. The light of God was on the streets, the gates were open wide. And oh, who would might enter? And no one was denied. No need of moon or stars by night or sun to shine by day. It was a new Jerusalem that would not pass away. It was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, sing for the night is o'er. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna forevermore. Hosanna in the Hallelujah, 
Alleluia, Alleluia. Into your hands, O Lord, we say we commend your servant Valerie. Acknowledge we only beseech you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sin of your own redeeming. Receive at the hands of your mercy and the cup of the saints in light. Amen. Into paradise may the angels lead you. At your coming, the mass receive you and bring you to the holy city, Jerusalem. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. I was asked to announce that refreshments are available in the hall just as soon as we are finished. Thank you. <laughs> 